Yes, hello, good morning from Hildesheim University. Um, I'm delighted that uh, we have such a broad audience again this morning. Uh, this is our fourth collaborative event, and today we'll focus on understanding the user experience. We have uh, four presentations. I think I really just want to echo uh, about comments there, and just for in terms of, of context, this is part of the, the Digital Shift Forum experience, as Abelton said, it's our fourth collaborative event. We're really excited to continue to be working and collaborating with our, our German colleagues and really having that opportunity to share and look at the ways in which libraries have continued to innovate and develop pioneering services in response to changing user needs. So without further ado, with any more from me, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, who is Anthony Groves from the University of Sussex Library. And Anthony is learning and teaching librarian at Sussex. And I'm going to hand over to Anthony to introduce himself and his presentation. So take it away, Anthony. Thank you, William. So I'll start um, sharing my screen now and ask the kind of obligatory question whether everyone can see it. So let me just check. Brilliant. So uh, can everyone see the title Users and Usage, Building and Evidence Base for Good Design? Perfect, thank you. So yes, my name's Anthony and I am one of the librarians at the University of Sussex Library. I'm gonna introduce myself in a little bit more detail as I go through the presentation. So this is what I wanna talk about today or as we're at RLUK in the, in the language of research librarians um, performing qualitative and quantitative research on our library services to further improve those services for the people using them. So this picture that I've got in the background is one I took a few summers ago outside the library and it's a really nice reminder uh, whenever I go onto campus of the, the desire lines that our, our users take. So whatever structures we build, they will tend to find the quickest way to find the information that we need and the quickest way to navigate them. I mean, more often than not, when we're thinking about our kind of digital presence and our web services, this is gonna be a search box. And I think it has really kind of important implications for how we structure information and how we think about our users moving through our digital environment. But that's probably a talk for another time. What I'd really like to focus on today are some of the approaches, the principles, the frameworks, the methods and the tools that we've used to try and find out more about our users and what they would like from our services. So, as I said, my name is Anthony and I am one of the learning and teaching librarians at the University of Sussex. What this basically means is among other things, I'm responsible for uh, teaching our students about our services and our resources, particularly undergraduates and taught postgraduates. Um, I'm also, kind of lead on the development of our website. So making those services easily discoverable and understandable. And I also look after the team that answer our online chat service. So any questions that users will have about these services. So I'm really interested in that front to back aspect of service design, whether that's how we talk to students about our services or whether that's questions we're answering about how they get the most out of them. And this ties in really closely with UX, and I also sit on the library's UX group. So a way to think about how these two areas of work function together, UX and service design, this is um, a diagram from the, Nor the Norman Nielsen group, and they're definitely worth kind of checking out the UX resources they have there. So when we talk about UX research, what we're really thinking about are those user-centric actions, so things that are focused on the users. So if this was the chat service that I oversee, when we're doing user research around this, we're looking at things that how easily students might find the chat box, so what web pages do we have them on, um, how easy the chat box is to use, is it easy to kind of type in your question, do you get a response quickly, and what sort of responses do you get? Are you getting kind of accurate quick responses from library staff who are providing that service. 
However, from the service design perspective, we take a step back and look a little bit more holistically at it. So we're gonna be looking at some of what are known as the front stage and backstage action and support processes. So those might be things like um, how we rotor staff to make sure that that service is offered effectively between nine and 5 p.m. Uh, maybe how those staff are trained, what pages we've added the chat box to, and even what chat service we're using, uh, one might be kind of better to use than the other. So we're starting to take yeah this more kind of holistic approach to looking at service design and UX. So what we actually have here, this representation, is something that's known as a service blueprint. And this is an activity we've just started and it's something we're gonna try and do over the summer, a little bit of UX research. And we're gonna be working with students and members of the library uh, to try and blueprint some of our key services. And the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna work with students and we're gonna ask them to um, create some user journeys. So some of their key user journeys. And this will be how they navigate through a particular service. So our chat box, for example, that might not be a service in its own right. What it might be is a touch point on a larger customer journey. So maybe what they're actually trying to do is find a book in the library. And the touch points for that journey might be that they use our library catalog, they're able to find that book, they come into the building and they use our big touchscreen kiosk, which has got our floor plans on, that might be another touch point, but maybe they're not able to find what they need on that map. So they then use our chat service to ask for support from staff. So it gives you a bigger picture of that whole journey. And then for the second part of the blueprinting, what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask staff at our annual library staff conference to start mapping these front stage actions, backstage actions and support processes as they relate to the different touch points. So what do we need? to provide that online chat effectively. What might we need uh, for that kiosk with the digital floor plan to work better? So that's one of the activities we're gonna be undertaking. And the students we're gonna be working with are our student connectors. And this is a, um, a kind of project that's running at the university. It's really useful to us because it means that we're able to work with students much more closely. I've got a short video which will explain it now much better than I'm able to. So I'll cross my fingers and hope that this works. Brilliant. The anticipation. Okay, can I bring you just to this here, just there? Right, yeah. <laughs> and am I looking at you? And go for it. Have you ever thought things at a university could be better and wanted to make a change? We did. That's why we became connectors. <laughs> <laughs> The Connector Programme is a community of students and staff. Where we work together in equal partnership. And everyone's perspectives are respected and valued. Hearing what the students actually need and want from us means we can develop innovative and meaningful ideas together. Co-creating projects which improve the university experience for everyone, including you. <laughs> While developing real life skills that employers are looking for, like problem solving, leadership, communication, and project management skills, and getting paid to be part of it. The University of Sussex Connector Programme. How students and staff make positive change together. So we have this really great route already where we can reach out to um, groups of students to get them to help with some of this work that we're doing. And another one of the projects that we're going to be doing with student connectors over the summer is redesigning our induction. So our kind of annual uh, welcome week and the lead up to that and the period we have after. And to do that, what we're going to be using is using the design councils um, Double diamond, double diamond framework for innovation. And this is just a really helpful way to conceptualize some of this work and think about how it fits together. So you have these two stages of uh, 
divergent and convergent thinking that discover stage and this is particularly where some of these UX research methods are really going to come in and be helpful and this is where we're going to ask our student connectors to talk to their peers talk to librarians about what they feel should be included in an induction talk to uh, their tutors about what they think it would be helpful for them to know to start off with and then we'll use the define stage so we'll look to think about what we can actually fit in an induction then we'll start developing those materials so the channels the videos podcasts web pages that we might use and this area the develop and deliver is another really important phase where some of these UX principles are going to come in. So as you're rapidly prototyping some of these uh, induction material, assessing them, testing them to make sure that they're working, that people looking at them are getting the information that they need. What you'll often find with design agencies is that you will have specialists doing different parts of this. So you might have content designers, you might have interaction designers, you might have UX researchers. But as, as librarians, I think we're all used to wearing lots of different hats. And I think there really is an opportunity here for staff development as well. And what you'll also see on the framework is we've got design principles and methods as well. So what we'll look at next are a couple of principles and methods that we've been using in the library. So you might be surprised uh, to hear that uh, the government design principles are some of the ones that we largely follow. And I'm pleased that we're on mute, so I can't hear any booing at this stage. Uh, and I'll be clear that I am only advocating uh, for their design principles. But these were put together by the former head of the government digital services, uh, Lou Down, who's also written this brilliant book, uh, Good Services, that I would highly recommend and will be speaking at the UX London conference uh, next month. But the design principles, there are 10 kind of key government design principles, but three that we try and kind of foreground in our work are starting with user needs, designing with data, iterating and iterating again. So it's thinking about this UX research that we're doing, the, the qualitative and quantitative data that we can get to kind of inform our services. And then, kind of to continue doing so, that continual improvement. So what we'll do now is finally, I'll finish off by looking at one of the methods. So we've looked at some of the frameworks and the principles that we used, but I wanted to share one that from my experience is a little less usual in our sector at the moment. We've used it several times in the library, but it's something known as a card sort. And it's a really useful method, particularly as we're kind of shifting over into the digital environment and the more that we're creating online, the more that we're making available online. So the idea with a card sort is it helps you to structure information. If you're creating a website, it helps you to build the architecture of the website around your users needs, around how they expect things to be put together, how they expect web pages to be structured. And the basic principle is you would have your web pages as these cards on the side, individual web pages. So it might be you've got a page that find a book, place an interlibrary loan, check your library account, whatever it might be. And then what the user would do that you're running this bit of research with would group these together into sections. So they would pull together the individual pages into sections that they thought made sense. If it was an open card sort, you would then also ask them to give that section a name. If it was a closed card sort, you would move it into existing sections. So if you're just adding a new kind of page to your website, you might do a closed card sort where you have the kind of six sections that are already on your website and you ask your users, where would you expect to find this page if we were to add it? What's really great about the card source is you get both qualitative and quantitative data. So if you do these in person, uh, and by that I mean kind of online, just live, um, you can ask the participant to think aloud and talk about the decisions that they're making. And you get, it becomes much richer, the um, information that you're able to find out. So it might be that actually they're struggling to decide which section to put something in. They might be struggling between two sections. So you can make a note of that. It might be that there's a page that they thought you'd have that you don't. They were really expecting to see a page on study skills or referencing, and they're really surprised that that isn't there. So you can also get this really kind of rich 
quantitative data from doing card sorts. Uh, and as I say, it's something we've done numerous times now, uh, and I've shown to other colleagues at the institution, and I know other departments are using this as well, and I'd really advocate for this approach. This particular tool, Optimal Sort from Optimal Workshop, um, there's a free version as well, which is why I wanted to include this, uh, and the link is at the bottom there. So I want to finish off just again with the, the kind of picture of desire lines from the start and to make it easier for you to find the information that you need what I'm going to do is um, copy these links into the chat box as well so anything that I've spoken about today you can easily follow up you don't need to worry about okay, going back through the whole presentation you can just get to the links there so I hope that was useful some of the yeah, approaches, the principles, the frameworks and methods that we've been using at Sussex and some of the projects that we've got going on over the summer uh, with our student connectors as well. Fantastic. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Actually, that's incredibly inspiring and really great to see all that exciting work which is going on at Sussex. So thank you very much, particularly, yeah, as is, is commented in the chat there, things like the, the student nectar program um, and the and the links. Um, so just moving on, however, so we will we'll come back so people can have the opportunity as you're, you're pasting the things into the, the chat uh, for colleagues to kind of raise some, some questions and some chat as we sort of move forward that we can then pick up. But I want to move on to Guy. So I'm delighted to uh, introduce Guy Baxter from the University of Reading. I've had the opportunity to do some great collaboration work with Guy. And I'm going to hand over to Guy now. Hello, I'm afraid my camera is taking a while to start. Um... Can't probably can't see me at the moment. Um, oh, there you are. Oh. You're there. You, yeah, Excellent. there you go. Well, hopefully we'll have no uh, problems with um, me sharing my screen and starting my presentation. Fingers crossed uh, for that. Um, thank you, William. Uh, it was really interesting, and really great to see what's going on at, at Sussex as well. Um, so I'm just going to share my slides and start uh, start this. Okay, hoping that this is working now and that we can uh, we can begin. So uh, good morning, everybody, uh, colleagues. I'm Guy Baxter. I'm Head of Archive Services at the University of Reading, where we have the Museum of English Rural Life and also our Special Collections Service. Um, today, I'm going to be uh, talking about, uh, about our approach to, to audiences. Um, I'm not anything like a, a UX design expert, um, I'm, I'm completely uh, an, an amateur at these things and um, as you'll see hope, uh, hopefully we've, we're trying to find a way through some quite complex issues uh, in, in a very practical way. Uh, Maslow, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yes, uh, uh, very, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen it, I'm sure we've all, uh, we've, we've all um, thinking this is, uh, this is very boring and old and uh, you're probably some of you are probably surprised because you thought our museum is famous just for being uh, quite amusing on on Twitter with that large sheep um, well I can tell you now we're not just about that sheep it's all very complex we've got all kinds of things going on and um, I'll explain some of those if you don't know about the sheep this was a this was a uh, this was a, something on our Twitter account that went viral, uh, got a huge number of, of likes um, and, and made us quite um, quite famous or infamous, I, I'm not sure, um, in the social media world. Um, but the Museum of English Rural Life is our largest and most high profile museum within the University of Reading. But we also, within our department, we look after collections of rare books, we look after archives across a large number of other subject areas, we look after artworks, we're involved in teaching and learning, we've got public engagement programmes going on. So there's a, a lot of activity that's happening, a lot of partnerships that are happening, and therefore a lot of audiences that we're having to meet the needs of. So. I've attempted to sort of uh, characterize some of that. 
um, by just, uh, I suppose, really just sort of thinking broadly about the, the, the sorts of, vis of, of, of audiences and users that we might encounter in, in a typical week. A drop-in museum visitor who's visiting the hospital across the road, just wants a break, come in, hasn't been before. An international visitor who's coming at the other end of perhaps of the spectrum, an international visitor studying Samuel Beckett's letters, coming for postdoctoral research um, with an appointment, having spoken to our inquiry service. Uh, a member of a community group that's supporting younger people with dementia, they're attending uh, perhaps a workshop, a, a gardening workshop in, in our museum garden. An architect, a student who's joining a collections based teaching session online. And of course, a, a Canadian teenager who finds us funny on Twitter. Um, and there are an awful lot of people in, uh, across around the world who are finding us, uh, but particularly in North America, actually, who find us funny on Twitter. Quite a diverse uh, group that we need to uh, think about. So um, I, I just wanted to look at the kind of, um, on the right of the screen, you have Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and on the left, we have something we've used called the uh, en engagement funnel. Um, so this is a very kind of, um, linear approach, I suppose, to how you might meet audience needs. Uh, you start thinking about, well, when they arrive, and you're making an assumption that they arrive somewhere, uh, you're, you're, uh, when they arrive, they're going to need to um, have their basic needs met. So they want to be welcomed, but they also they want to be able to find that there's a cafe and that there are a, a toilets that they can use and that the museum is at a, a, a temperature that's comfortable for them, et cetera, et cetera. They want to feel safe and secure. But they also will then want to be inspired. Uh, they want to, to see things that 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 help them uh, gain knowledge, to um, to uh, gain understanding, so uh, to be entertained. So we move up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the same time, we're looking through this uh, this engagement funnel. We've used this quite a lot with digital, but you're starting about out with awareness and then interest into consideration, connect, making a connection with people. So those approaches are very kind of uh, are very useful and, and remain useful as ways of thinking about how you uh, how your audience, how your user approaches you and how you welcome and deal with your audience. Uh, now, Anthony actually alluded to this, um, although uh, I think he was with, with the um, with the blueprint that he was uh, showing us, which was uh, this this uh, user centered and uh, and staff centered models or saying system centered in, in some ways. And I think it's very true that across museums, libraries and archives, there's a disconnect between sort of access to collections information for researchers and access to digitized content for a wider audience. And that sort of gives us a spectrum in terms of our online engagement about uh, access that's that, that's very much focused on audiences and very much or optimized for audiences and optimized for the system so uh, at one end you've got uh, you've got the type of access which is actually quite labor intensive quite creative writing blogs social media uh, having conversations with people at the other end you may well have things where you you are serving up a catalog and you're hoping that people are able to find their way or designing it so that people can find their way around that and so that it can deliver lots of information very, very quickly and, and systematically. Trying to serve both audiences from that sing, sort of single source of truth, our collections, our knowledge, our information. Like I say, it can be very labor intensive and it can also be fraught with danger. And the main danger is that you fail to serve the needs of either audience by trying to too hard to do both. Um, so I, I, we're aware of that and we're aware that trying to work across so many audiences can often put us in a difficult situation in terms of spreading ourselves too thinly. So yes, we do get a little bit lost in the woods sometimes and, uh, and, and uh, the snow is building up and we don't know which path to take. So I'm going to just talk about two, um, two projects, one which is very museum centered and one which is uh, focused on a research collection from our, our university special collections and talk about how we've at least brought some user centered thinking into those projects and how that's helped us. So the first one is based around a project which is, is broader than just this issue, um, a, a project um, that was about how how users engage, particularly with the uh, with, our, with museum galleries, but it, it had all sorts of other strands to it as well. Um, uh, called building connections, and as part of that project, we commissioned some consultants, Lindsay Clark and Ken Boyd, uh, to research uh, and give us, I suppose, the state of the art on good practice in museums for layered 
interpretation, particularly layered digital interpretation, digital online and digital on site. And from their report, um, they really encouraged us to look at uh, user motivations in particular. So really you know, back to those models, back to the funnel of engagement, back to, to Maslow, but really looking at those. But also thinking about the user's varying relationships with the museum, actually looking on a, on a kind of a warm to cold type of uh, relationship uh, uh, that the user may have with the museum. And one of the, the sort of key moments of that uh, was, was looking at, uh, based on, on the work that Mitchell Whitelaw has done, looking at generous browse interfaces. So Mitchell Whitelaw's work is about kind of this idea that when you give someone a search box, what you're actually doing is you're saying, look at our collections, but you have to look at it as if you're looking through the letterbox of a, 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 on a front door. So actually so, saying, actually, we, we need to make our interface, particularly for, for, for certain audiences, much more, uh, generous, much more immediate, where they can start to see the content straight away, uh, bringing in more aspects of storytelling and a kind of blending of online and on-site digital interpretation. So out of that, we then identified five different user types. So this was really in terms of thinking much more about the Museum of English Rural Life website. So. Um, we know we're successful on social media, but but when you when they come to the website, it was perhaps not quite so so fully thought through, um, and uh, in need of of some some uh, greater focus on on user experience. And those user types were people who were looking for information about an in person visit, so intending to to visit in person. Then we had our new digital visitors and our browsers many of them coming from, from social media, but, but also from other sources as well. <clears throat> then we had to think about those people who've engaged with us digitally and have come back for more and ensuring that their experience is not just, they're getting exactly the same as they had last time, keeping people um, entertained and given new information and giving new, ins giving new inspiration to them. Uh, and then we had and th these last two groups you could almost put together actually uh, researchers um, and and special groups such as uh, people booking groups in or uh, or uh, teachers looking to bring a, a teaching session uh, to us. So um, more highly motivated in terms of this of having a very specific need that they're, they're trying to to have met and that they probably know that we are likely or able to meet that need. And we did some analysis. You can see some of the questions we were looking at uh, down on the left-hand side of the screen. What are we doing for this visitor? What do they need? What makes it success? Their visit successful? What makes their visit uh, successful from a staff point of view rather than from just from their point of view? And how does the journey end? So really starting to think about constructing those user journeys. And then we've started to turn that into some, some technical work. Um, particularly on uh, one section of the museum website, which is very much aimed at the general, uh, the general visitor. Um, so the person who's um, audience type two on our, on, our, um, on our previous slide. So the people who are coming primarily from social media, who are probably an online only visitor and creating a, a, sim uh, so a simpler journey for those new digital users with layered content, with some curated content and some semi-curated content, which is this generous interface, um, generous visual index, uh, lots and lots of images that can, can come up. Um, and then we also looked, and I think this is really important. Um, and, and again, uh, it goes back to something that Anthony was saying about the front stage, uh, backstage and support services um, aspects of that, that, that type of model, which is also looking at uh, an easier workflow to encourage us to be able uh, to, to add it to incentivize us to add more content to the site which obviously is, is also very important and more calls to action for our for our users so uh still uh, a bit in development that aspect of the of the website but we're pretty pleased with um with how that's been going so the second project i wanted to talk about um is to do with an archive of an experimental filmmaker stephen Poskin. Um, a, a very large hybrid collection of digital and analog material, including a large volume of digital files on 20 hard disk drives, um, containing things like unfinished versions of films, email correspondence, personal documents. Uh, so a, 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 re a real challenge in terms of, uh, and it has been a real challenge and, 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 and a, a big challenge actually for the, uh, for the team in terms of dealing with uh, born digital content. 
but also a challenge in terms of how best to make content discoverable and available from such a, a large and complex collection. So uh, one of the things we did, although this is part of a large Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, research project um, led by Professor Rachel Garfield in our art department, we also managed to secure some UK National Archives testbed funding to look at a specific aspect, which is visualize, how visualizations of large data sets can enable archivists to explore and catalog uh, digital content, testing our internal workflows, but also looking very much at how best to help users navigate the relationship between say online access, reading room access, the different ways in which you might approach a collection like that. And we'd be looking at the use of emulation as well as extracting uh, content from those, uh, from those disk drives and making it available on dedicated digital terminals. So we've got a variety of solutions that we could apply. So how does how did UX design, how did a user-centric approach uh, help us with that? Well, uh, I'm not going to go into all the detail about this, but um, we you can see from this uh, piece of analysis that we started and I found it very useful to start thinking about our users um, uh, as having different motivations, different needs. So someone who's looking at broad research on Stephen Dwoskin's methodology may require very significant contextual information, as opposed to someone who's perhaps only got a preliminary interest, perhaps they're doing an essay on experimental film more generally, and then they want to find out some information about, about Dwoskin maybe, and, and, and might need to look at something in the archive, but possibly not. And so uh, I, I've just highlighted um, just one particular aspect, which is about how the approach to the catalogue. So obviously the catalogue in any archived library or museum service is a key tool that you're using to communicate information. And this, uh, as, it, as it happened, the way this analysis went was we could sort of use the catalogue almost as a as a uh, as a litmus test of <clears throat> uh, of whether we were meet, able to meet the, the user needs. So the user one, the catalogue is probably not enough. We need something on top of that. Visualizations come into play very much. Uh, emulations may well do as well, data manipulation. Uh, user, user two, the catalogue is probably about right. Um, that, that's probably the, the, the sensible approach is to direct people to the catalogue. And for user three, the catalogue may well be too much. We want to give them information that's presented in a simpler form. We don't want to overwhelm them with the information. So again, very useful to take that user centric approach and then start to think about how our services and our systems plug into that. And then we've been doing some, some work with colleagues uh, at the University of Glasgow, uh, Dr. Yun Yong Kim, and Dr. Zoe Bartliff, and actually also uh, Dr. Frank Hopfgartner, who's at the University of, of Sheffield. And we've been looking at, at testing um, some of these, uh, some of the visualizations as well, so that you can start to, to, to see, because testing is such an important part of this, um, of this whole process. It's all very well for us to identify these user groups to start to, to think about how we might match those needs, but until you test it, and again, as, as Anthony has said, it's very, very difficult to, to, to really know whether you've, you've, your assumptions are going to be correct. So testing and iterating is going to be an important part of, of that. And more on, on those visualizations, there's a link there where you can find more about the visualizations uh, that we've used in this uh, project. So still a long way to go for us. I've not touched on all kinds of aspects of our services where, um, where I think um, we've either started to have a think about a more user-centered approach or where we're already doing that work, uh, for instance, around teaching and learning. Um, but I hope that that was a helpful sort of introduction to how we've started to make use of some of some of this thinking and some of these techniques and um, if anyone has any questions or feedback um, uh, that, that they are, are unable to, to do today do feel free to, to get in touch with me. Thanks very much. That's great. Thank you very much Guy and I, I will certainly be sort of reappraising how I look at search boxes and letter boxes uh, going forward. So, um, and actually, if you, you could possibly um, share that DOI for the article in the chat, that would be useful as well for colleagues. So we can pick up questions that people kind of may have, but thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to pass the baton over to Eval now, who is going to introduce our colleagues from Germany and lead us into the, the sort of second half of this morning's presentations. William, thank you. 
Um, yes, uh, we will have uh, our next presentations or one presentation by Nino Frank. Uh, she is subject specialist and head of public relations at Hildesheim University Library and uh, by her col colleague Eric Zenz. He is a teaching librarian and head of information services at Leuphana University Library at Lüneburg. They will talk about capturing and understanding the changing perspective and needs of our users and about new services that were created as a result. And Ninon and Eric will focus on a project which started in the early phase of the COVID-19 pandemic and which actually fostered the cooperation between several German academic libraries uh, when creating new online services. And I now hand over to Nino and Eric. Yes, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, dear colleagues, um, Thank you first for your invitation here to the, uh, to the RL UK Digital Shift Forum and today's special event, Understanding the User Perspective, a Germany-UK Dialogue. My colleague uh, Nino Frank from Hildesheim and myself, Eric Sins from Lundborg, uh, have already been introduced. Um, Nino and I, uh, we are both members of the Tutorials in Libraries Network, which is some kind of a uh, grassroots initiative, one could say, uh, that developed uh, in the wake of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and which aims to uh, connect librarians uh, all over Germany and beyond to enable mutual support uh, for the community in the development of uh, tutorials. And well, we are very pleased to be here um, today and give you a short overview of this project, give you a brief introduction to the network, its activities and services. But before we start with this overview, uh, let's first take a look back at the roots uh, of this project, at the network's beginnings, and above all, shed some light on the background against which the network developed. And as you can imagine, uh, this is the COVID-19 um, pandemics, um, the disruptive moment of this uh, pandemic, and the compulsion for digital transformation processes as a consequence of this. The corona pandemic had and has noticed be for all of us, I think, a uh, disruptive character in many ways. For example, with regard to the necessity of uh, keeping uh, distances between uh, people, the one and a half meter rule, uh, you all know it, I'm sure. Um, this means you have to keep distance, what means that uh, it is impossible to meet, to communicate in larger uh, groups. Uh, and through uh, these restrictions, um, these limitations of opportunities in the spatial, the digital becomes more and more uh, important. So the pandemic has greatly um, accelerated the digital transformation process as a whole. People should stay home. Uh, and communicate digitally, this is a, a big, big change, um, the disruption we all experienced. The same in higher education. Uh, so students were switched to home office mode. Um, instead of going to the lecture hall, students were expected uh, to study and work on their own at home, using only the text materials provided by their lecturers. And in the early months of the COVID-19, they got lots of text material, PDF bundles and packages of ebooks and articles, um, because this was the only uh, digital content available for the lecturers. And providing this content was the only on the fly uh, teaching method available to most of the instructors. Uh, so the shift from face-to-face -face, uh, university to temporary, at least temporary uh, distance learning uh, online university was not so easy for most of the lecturers, I think. Um, but um, they got uh, better uh, as um, the pandemic progressed um, and learned a lot about media didactics. Um, they tried out new features from the learning platforms and used more and more interactive tools, uh, other media types beyond digital, uh, digitally presented texts such as video or audio, social media, and so on. 
And so they improved online learning a lot. And in parallel to this evolutionary process um, of improving online learning, the students themselves uh, developed uh, their expectations towards uh, online content and their aspirations about the quality of online learning. So in the further process, um, this described digital shift in online learning led to an uh, increased demand situation at libraries as well. Um, here demonstrated via this uh, curve. Uh, increasingly, instructors, students, uh, administrators uh, ask now if the library uh, could please support and create a tutorial, uh, develop a screencast for a seminar, uh, presentation with audio for lecture, uh, developing a virtual tour in 360 degree for YouTube, for example. So many libraries were now uh, increasingly uh, faced with the fact that they were not really prepared for the scenario, that they were struggling a little bit to keep up with these rapidly evolving uh, demands and to adequately meet expectations quantitatively and qualitatively. And so if this first curve here shows um, um, the expanding user needs, growing user needs and expectations, this uh, second curve here um, shows um, where libraries uh, stood at this moment. Uh, of course, <clears throat> this is not empirical data as you can <laughs> imagine. Um, my main purpose in doing this illustration was to show uh, from the library's point uh, of view, this emerging wave of user expectations certainly had something threatening about it. Uh, maybe like a wave of uh, demands crashing over you. The curve even looks a little bit like this, uh, I think. And librarians are not always e-learning specialists, so um, they only have limited skills and resources to meet those uh, demands. Um, this has been the situation uh, the uncomfortable situation for most of the libraries, I think. Yeah, but at the same time, there are some libraries that are already riding this wave of higher, uh, of higher user expectations uh, that have long been on a path of digital transformation in the area of information literacy and for whom e-learning, interactive tutorials, um, etc., are already part of their didactical uh, repertoire. Um, these libraries were long before COVID-19 on a high level, and they too now have gained uh, even more momentum through the corona-induced demands, uh, are continuing uh, to develop further, um, got better uh, during this um, pandemic in uh, developing tutorials, and could so in some cases even exceed uh, the expectations of the users. What I think is important about this whole uh, diagram, um, the space between these two uh, curves uh, opens up a wide uh, spectrum of libraries. At one end of the scale, libraries that are just taking their first steps in e-learning and tutorial development. And on the other end of the scale, libraries that are already much further along. Uh, what both, what all have in common is that the topic is equally important uh, for all of them right now. And the breadth of the spectrum offers the potential uh, to get uh, together, to join forces and to learn from each other in terms of didactics, technology, software, licenses, and much more. And maybe this final um, thought is what Nino uh, had on our mind. Uh, on a cold and frosty winter's day on the 13th of January, 2021 in Hildesheim, uh, Nino. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we are changing now from uh, global to the local view. And I'm going to tell you how the idea for, for this network came about. In the winter of 2020, our library was still closed because of the pandemic. So many of our servers went through a change and uh, surprisingly, almost nobody read our extensive uh, explanations on our website or on our blog. So to reach our users, we began to create tutorials with Camtasia. 
And for us, it was learning by doing. Uh, from time to time, we ran into problems to which we had to find a solution. This way, we still created a number of videos and uploaded them on our website. We wanted them to be accessible for persons with different backgrounds, so we always made three versions. One normal version in German, one with German subtitles, and one with English subtitles. After a while, we had a long list of tutorials on our website, and this quickly became very confusing. So our solution was to create a YouTube channel for our library. And again, we ran into problems, which was rather frustrating. So we said, it would be really nice to have someone to talk to, someone who either has the same problems or has already found a solution. And that was the birth uh, of the idea for, our tut for the tutorials and network library, uh, for the tutorials and libraries network. Then we formulated a call and sent it through the German librarian mailing list called EINETWIP. I don't know if you know it. Um, I received the first registration seven minutes after sending it and the stream of emails did not stop until the first meeting on 3rd March, 2021. We had a total of 160 registrations. Apparently it was not only us who had questions and this desire for an exchange. So we met online via Big Blue Button with 136 persons from all kinds of libraries, big and small, one person libraries, public libraries, school and university libraries, not only from Germany, but also from German speaking countries like Austria and Switzerland as well. Our main aim is exchange, an exchange of ideas, obviously, but also the possibility to, the possibility to say, I have a problem, is there someone who can help me? Or more specifically, I saw that you were working with this program, I have a problem, can you help me? If you speak German or have learned the language, you know that there's a difference when you address someone formally or informally, if you use Z or do, because we knew that this could be a problem and hinder exchange, we proposed that we could call each other informally and on um, first name basis. If someone wants to, wants to be addressed formally, that is okay too. However, until now, this hasn't happened. On the contrary, I always sense a small kind of relief when I offer the informal way. For us, it is not important in which kind of library our participants work or what kind of background they have. What matters to us is if, is if they are interested in tutorials. So back to our main aim exchange. Next slide, please, Eric. Uh, this network Network's aim is uh, to exchange ideas, how we can create better tutorials for our users. To enable our participants to do that, our network is built on four pillars. We have online meetings, we have the TIP AV portal, we have a Discord channel, and we have a wiki on Myra Hesi. So how do we proceed to help li librarians to, to create tutorials or better ones for their users? Next slide, please. Firstly, we organize our online meetings more or less regularly. We invite other network enthusiasts to share their knowledge. Next slide, please. Past meetings had topics like didactic methods. So how do you build up a narration that is interesting and informative? Or tools, which programs and platforms can you use? Or voice and sound, how do you create a tutorial that is worth listening to? Or one of our final meetings had the subject uh, universal design of tutorials. This focused accessibility and users with impairments. We also had the EduTuber Daniel Hunold as a guest. He showed us how YouTube can be used for insights into user behavior, how to find new subjects for tutorials and how to attract new, new viewers. This was very helpful because user feedback is difficult to obtain. Next slide, please. Secondly, we record our meetings uh, like this one, for example, uh, and make them available, available on the so-called TIP AV portal. This portal is a service for uploading scientific videos and is for, provided by the Technical Information Library in Nova. You find our videos with the hashtag dip tutorials. Next slide, please. Thirdly, we have a Discord channel for questions, which arise between our online meetings and need to be answered quickly. 
We also encourage exchanging ideas, discuss problems and post new findings as well as tips and tricks. Like, have you ever written a text and nobody did the proofreading before you published it? How often did you regret that afterwards? It's the same with tutorials. If you have created a video, we advise you to let someone watch it, someone who is not involved in the process before, publish, before publishing it. Our experience is that when you work at it over a longer time, you get lost in the details. You are bound to miss things that do not work out. Therefore, a fresher perspective helps. If you do not have that in your library, our network has help and give you feedback. Next slide, please. Our fourth pillar is Wiki. Um, we use the Wiki hosting service Myra Easy. There you find all our, all our knowledge on how to create tutorials. One of our enthusiasts, Frank Waldschmidt Dietz, who is here today too, perhaps you can say hello afterwards, even has written a guide uh, and how to guide for tutorials, which you can download. Until now, all our information is in German. So if you want to translate it, please do, feel free to, to do so. Alternatively, and this is perhaps a question for our discussion, do you have a British equivalent? If so, we are grateful for contact. Next slide, please. As our network is a grassroots initiative, everyone is welcome to join and share and to participate. Our organization committee consists not only of Eric and me, but also uh, of Philipp Leisering from the University Library in Magdeburg and of Frank Waldschmidt-Dietz from the Library of the Justus Ludwig University in Gießen. Uh, I saw at least Frank here today. Perhaps Philipp is uh, here too. So next slide, please. Our outlook or what we are planning for the immediate future are these two points. Our next meeting breaks with our tradition to meet online. We are organizing a hands-on lab at the German Library Congress in Leipzig. This will be next month, uh, uh, very, very soon. During two hours, we organize a meeting with Barcamp feeding. So because we are interested in, interest, interested in the topics of our particip participants concerning tutorials, I think this will be educating and more important fun. Uh, that was too fast, Eric. Thank you. A side note on this, we four have been working together for over a year to organize online meetings and presentations, uh, presentations at different conferences, but we have never met in person until now. Therefore, the hands-on lab in Leipzig will be our first live meeting, and I'm very curious to find out if we recognize each other. Um, our next point is collaborations. We are opening our network for collaborations outside of libraries. We think that there are topics we have in common with museums, for example, like, like Guy showed, perhaps we can talk after that, or with other forms of educating users like podcasts. In one of our next online meetings, our guests will be the team around the podcast Bitte. They aim to explain how scientific libraries work. This is interesting for us on many levels, especially in how, how they create their episodes with their users in mind. So that concludes my part in our talk. So now the final slide, please. If you want to know more about our network, you can find all, all our information on informationskompetence.de with all the links to our pillars. If you have any questions, ask us, ask us now or write us an email. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nino and Eric, for this inspiring presentation and uh, for sharing this very impressive example of um, cooperating even uh, during the pandemic and uh, working closely together, uh, even if you can't meet face to face. Thanks so much. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, please feel free to ask questions in English or in German or post them in the chat. And please don't all rush at once. So um, about, I, I'm going to look back to kind of 
Anthony. I saw Anthony had a, a, um, a, a question about the, the connectors program at Sussex. So the, the connectors program, that's, that looks like that you know, university initiative then that you've been able to tap into. That's, that's correct, yes. And I guess to give an idea of um, the kind of commitment the students are able to give to us, currently the project we've got um, around the service blueprinting, that's going to be about three months and we've got four students who will be working with us four hours a week. So it's a large chunk of time, so more than we would normally get if we were arranging user testing through the library, we'd maybe be able to offer some sort of incentive and we'd talk to students for half an hour or an hour. So we're getting them for a large chunk of time and we're able to develop this really interesting project, which is something we've not been able to do previously. And that is, yeah, through the university, the university pay the students, we put these proposals forward at the start of term. No, that's, that's really interesting. And I think the the sort of the, the, the payment side is a really interesting one as well, because I know certainly we've done uh, a variety of user testing uh, with students at, at the University of Glasgow. We've uh, tend, we've tended to kind of incentivize and kind of reward them through sort of Amazon vouchers or other kind of vouchers. And it's perhaps not been as sort of structured in that, that same way as the sort of the, the connectors program. Uh, does it so so that sounds that sounds like a really kind of exciting opportunity for you guys to have have, have tapped into have tapped into that absolutely now do colleagues have questions for guy and anthony and eric and neon i'll just continue to monitor the yes that's a uh... A question for Ninon uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, Ninon, how do you collect feedback from your or for your YouTube tutorials? Um, that's an interesting question because it's not really easy. Um, we use, uh, that is one of the reasons we use YouTube because there you have the insights um, uh, how how viewers uh, watch your video, how often, when do they uh, stop watching your video so they, you can see uh, at which point they drop out and then you can uh, look if, uh, if there's something boring or if something doesn't work out. But we only have indirect uh, feedback. Um, perhaps Frank can tell more about this because he is a, is a kind of an expert for this. Are you there? Do you want to tell something? Or oh, Eric, do you want to say more about this? If not, Eric, do you want to say something about this? Uh, sorry, I uh, didn't hear the question. I must admit. <laughs> so sorry. Um, how do we get feedback for our video tutorials? Uh, how do you do yeah. this uh, in Uh We don't uh, collect uh, feedback at the moment. That's the <laughs> simple answer. Um, it's a little bit complicated in Germany, maybe in uh, UK, the same. Uh, with the uh, data of the users and uh, the comments uh, they leave. And that's a little bit uh, problematic. Uh, normally, we collect uh, data via our learning platforms, uh, via SCOM standards or anything like this. Uh, and uh, YouTube uh, is a little bit more problematic in Germany um, in, in general. There was another question uh, concerning the software uh, you are using. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Nino already answered it in the chat. Um, it is Camtasia and Powtoon. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, programs, uh, I think. So the list is very long from Camtasia, Adobe Captivate, Adobe Presenter, anything like this, or uh, OBS. Um, DaVinci Resolve, there are lots of programs for different purposes, like more screencasting, like more doing with the camera. Um, so um, this is not uh, one, one software we can 
uh, we can say, but a longer list of uh, typical programs uh, that were used in the network um, we are standing for. And there's also the question of the costs because uh, buying a license is not uh, cheap. So you have to you have to compare what you want and if you can uh, finance this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, resources are a problem always. Yes. Uh. That's the way it is. There's another question for you, Nino. Uh, did you create any content directly as a result of, of contacts requests from your users? So. Um, uh, not in a direct way. Um, I, we had the problem that many students don't know how the IPN works. So we created a tutorial for that because it was rather complicated to install it uh, before we had the new version. Uh, and that was uh, one of our videos, which was uh, really success success successful. And Eric, do you have any, how, how do yeah, you create? Uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, demands as I <laughs> pointed out in my um, presentation. Uh, so we got here in Lüneburg um, different uh, demands. Uh, for example, a virtual tour was uh, demanded through the library uh, via YouTube and um, uh, videos for freshman meetings, uh, anything you can imagine. Um, so there were direct, uh, direct demands. And um, we tried our best to fulfill them. <laughs> yeah. Often we um, we ask our our colleagues who work in the, at the information desk because they know which questions arise uh, regularly. So we um, that's where we get our ideas maybe. There's another question from William in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm happy to pull that in. I was just kind of interested around, obviously, things like Camtasia have sort of challenges with the, the license costs, but also the the challenge around kind of upskilling staff and mm -hmm. presenting and, you know, being able to, you know, develop those, those tools. How have you, how have you found that and how, how engaged have sort of... That's, that's the aim of the, of the network, um, I think. So we try to come together to learn from each other. We have different talks to different subjects, uh, like recording a video or uh, working with the voice. So the further uh, development of skills of librarians um, uh, concerning different tools is uh, one of the big aims um, to get together in this network. Uh, no, absolutely, but I've, I've had it, but just to get a sense of, yeah, has there been quite a lot, quite a lot of enthusiasm and excitement, perhaps not excitement, but about kind of learning these, learning these new skills and taking advantage of them? Um, I'm sorry, I, I had a little bit of problem with the audio. Um, so, no, I, it was just to get a sense of just the, the enthusiasm around uh, around learning these skills because I think what you what you've been putting together there I think looks looks really great and there's been some comment in the chat that there's certainly lessons that I think we can pick up from from that here in the in the UK. Um, often these I can um, say that um, often these programs or platforms offer tutorials on their own so you can uh, educate yourself. Um, and these are really good, especially Camtasia offers really good tutorials uh, on different aspects of their program. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. And I might add that uh, we have uh, more colleagues um, uh, with, with, ex with Camtasia experience. And that's because we are running the uh, learning management system uh, of our university um, in our library. And uh, that means that we uh, have a lot of contact with, with lecturers. Uh, we have a lot of technical demands. 
and uh, the administrator uh, and his colleagues are, are in our library. Um, the computer center does all the hardware and, and software stuff like updates, etc. Uh, but when it comes to, to uh, user support, um, that's us. And that's always challenging, of course, <laughs> but sometimes it's, it's also rewarding because uh, uh, we had to do with Camtasia and, and, and other software uh, even before uh, this uh, horrible pandemic started and we had to, uh, or, or uh, let's put it that way. Um, it, it gave us the chance um, to uh, use Camtasia and other software in another context that helped. Um and I might add, our colleagues were, were enthusiastic about learning this new skill. Um, perhaps we are lucky, <laughs> but um, they they really liked it. And I also enjoyed to, to work with that and to learn this because it's so helpful in many ways. Yes, and I think enthusiasm is a key factor <laughs> in learning new tools. There's another question. Um, what kind of videos do you create? Uh, just talking to students or do you have screenshot videos showing how to use uh, e-resources with voiceovers, et cetera? Um, uh, talking to students, um, please keep in mind this project started uh, when our library was closed and uh, when there were no students on campus. And students got back um, slowly, and it's not uh, not before the the the, the beginning of, of this summer semester uh, that we see uh, a lot of students on campus again. Fortunately, mm -hmm. uh, before uh, the campus was uh, was was kind of empty. So talking to students um, uh, in in person was difficult, but. Perhaps you can you can add on that and, and enlarge on that, Eric or or you know. Um, sorry. So the question was really around: um, Are your videos sort of the staff talking to your students about a particular topic, like you were giving a lecture, kind of virtually, or are you kind of doing instructional videos specifically on how to use specific? Um, products that you have made available to your students? Um, in Hildesheim, we don't uh, film our staff. Uh, we, I think we are kind of shy, <laughs> um, but we use animations and uh, use uh, show how websites, and uh, especially if, you, if, uh, if it's about the VPN um, tutorial, um, we show how this works step-by-step so it's more an instruction and uh, information than showing our staff. Is it different in, in Lüneburg, Eric? No, not really, I think. <laughs> so employees here are a little bit shy too, I think. Um, but um, we have students here um, that are um, that are actors too in parallel, and uh, we asked them if uh, they could do the job for us and <laughs> play a role in this uh, video tutorial and give a short virtual tour through the library. And they did a very good job, uh, better than we could, and that was a good solution and was not too expensive, I think, uh, because uh, she was a student. Uh, that was our solution for this uh, problem of, of shyness. Yeah. And but thanks very much, Eric. And I think about just bring Antony in there as well. So you'd kind of commented just in the in the chat there, you, you were kind of using a mix of the sort of mix of, of those sort of material. We were, yes. So we were doing um, some of the screencasts that we normally do. We use a tool, uh, an institutional tool called Panopto to make those. We had used Camtasia previously. Um, but one platform that we started making a lot of use of over the pandemic was Instagram Live, uh, because we already had a lot of followers on Instagram. And what this allowed us to do was to have, uh, we did tours of the library. So as the 
kind of space was evolving as we were opening it up in stages. We would do regular kind of live remote tours as opposed to a video that might date within a week or two. And we were doing live Q and A's with the students union as well. So they'd come in and speak to us and we'd talk about what the current policies were. And again, we might update that in a couple of weeks time if things had changed. And that was a really useful way to get up to date information on our dynamic services out there by using Instagram Live. Right, thanks very much, Anthony. Uh, and in fact, actually, that uh, leads me to to sort of a, a wider question for for all of you. And I think you know, having kind of pivoted to things like Instagram Live, have you found and obviously with you know use of YouTube and things, I'm not going to ask which is which is better, you know, doing, you know, obviously you get different means of production and so on, but have you found that, you know, really effectively harnessing social media has actually really helped some of that engagement and that user experience that I think we're all trying to achieve, depending on how you actually, uh, how you actually use it and where you, where you fit it in to the mix. I, I think so, yes. And I, I think um, pushing the, uh, the information out through channels where students and our users already are is always helpful as well, instead of expecting them to necessarily come to us, um, kind of, yeah, moving into their spaces has been really helpful. And I think we've definitely, through those Instagram um, videos, so the library tours were getting sort of 600 views, which is far more than we would have got on a physical library tour sort of years back. So we were certainly getting to a a wider audience. And may I ask one question? Um, Anthony, do you have discussions about this? Because using social media in Germany is often involved in different discussions if, it's, if it is okay to use these. Uh, do you have this in, at your institution too? Or is this a, a German thing? <laughs> I, I think we do. We have a, a team actually and a, and a working group that look around how we kind of promote and use social media and I think they have those kind of discussions um, in those meetings. Thankfully I, I just get to sort of uh, do it and someone else has to worry about the consequences. Uh, do you use TikTok? Uh, we don't at the moment, no. Although I discovered and I, I wasn't aware of this how popular it is particularly uh, in supporting chemistry students uh, and how many kind of chemistry experiments are on TikTok. So I think that's a really kind of fascinating channel for us to explore. I think another one that we don't use a lot of, and these are the sort of insights I think you get from working with students regularly, was uh, when I last met the student connectors and asked them how they would like to communicate through this project, whether they'd like to use Teams or Zoom, or they all said Slack. And Slack isn't a channel that we currently use in the library. It's one we're aware of, and one that we tried briefly at the start of the pandemic, but this particular group of students, it's all that they use. And what do you use uh, to communicate? So we'll use Slack and I'll upskill myself quickly as the plan. Okay, and in your library, because we, um, we had a chat program um, installed uh, to, to communicate during uh, home office and uh, for us, it was really great. Well, it is really good. We are still using it. Yeah, we, we mainly use Microsoft Teams for that kind of um, communication between library staff. And then our chat service is a, a platform called Olark. Thank you. So just to follow up from that, Leanne, do you want to? unmute and ask your your kind of just follow up with that around um yes i'm just wondering if, if because um most universities have a kind of reputation to maintain in the wider academic communities and possibly even on a global scale do you have to involve anyone at kind of the the head of your institutions in terms of what content you place on social media to ensure it doesn't um do anything to affect your kind of institution's brand or reputation I'm just conscious whether you, I'm, just one, I'm curious sorry whether you're um, able to to do things in-house yourselves or whether you have to be mindful of what you're putting out there 
I, I, because I it's for everyone, say, not just your students. I, I can probably say something about that because um, uh, obviously w within the University of Reading, we've um, uh, the social media for the Museum of English Rural Life is is massively bigger, even than our main institutional um, presence on on particularly on Twitter, and um, and and so that's been a really interesting position to be in. Um, and obviously, we've used it in a very light-hearted way, uh, a very you know engaging way. Um, and I think that's um, I think that's been I think that was surprising to the institution. I think it was surprising to us. Um, but I think it shows that I mean I think firstly, universities are uh, yes are are corporate bodies, but they are also places where uh, they, that that should at least be encouraging free debate and uh, and and discussion. So um, within the parameters that you'd expect in terms of normal social media management. Um, and uh, then, then I think it's been. Um, I, I think it's it, it's fine. I don't think most places are expecting. The, I mean, a university is going to have hundreds of social media accounts from different departments, and they're not going to be managing most of those corporately unless there's something really, uh, really important that they would do. I think quite often social media managers are meeting with each other and agreeing guidelines and and good practice and uh, and ensuring that happens. But I think you know, in the end, it's going to come down to the sort of risk appetite of the. Of the institution and where it's going to be, but I think we, you know, one of the things that we've discovered or shown, possibly or both, is that uh, is that it's possible to be actually quite daring and quite um, quite innovative in terms of use of use of social media. And I think um, I think certainly, yeah, you know, museums and libraries in many ways of, of uh, and, and archives have, have in some ways led some of some of that uh, kind of um, helping people to engage with institutions that, from if you were to go to their normal digital presence, might seem quite forbidding. Actually, I think the social media has been a way of kind of saying, actually, we're people here. We're behind that that kind of corporate slick website. There are people who are who are um, who who can joke and can be uh, talk about important things and can talk about unimportant things, and and can engage with you. So I think social media has a really strong role in terms of that. And I think um, if you if you shut it down and say you can't, you know, we're we're going to check every tweet. You'll just you'll just you'll just uh, it would just kill it off. Um, you need to be responsive as well. You need to be actually, it's not just putting out the content, it's actually being able to respond to what people are saying and interacting. So thanks very much, Guy. And uh, Lisa, I haven't clicked on the link in your chat yet, So, um, but it looks as if Liverpool have started using TikTok. Uh, I don't know if you want to unmute and say a little bit about that, just as part of this social media segment of this morning hi yeah sure hi everyone um well as i said in the in the uh, in my little message really i don't know very little about it but we um we've got quite an active twitter presence and instagram presence at the university of liverpool library it's all there is a university um as i'm sure there is in in many places there is a university kind of you know policy on using social media but but as um, as we've just heard, you know, that we, we really feel that it's important to show the people behind behind the services, and that and that really came to the fore in the pandemic. So, um, so I'm glad to say that you know there are, we've got lots of library staff who are way younger than me and they're really much more technical than me and know how all of this stuff works and so they just kind of keep you know keep putting things out it's, it's all it's all you know authorized it's not you know it's not that they just put things out willy-nilly but um but yeah we are, we are exploring how that we can how we can just make the library seem a more kind of you know human kind of space really if you want to a better way of putting it Thank you. That, that is totally fascinating because uh, you mentioned that you need staff for, who is who wants to do this, who is uh, enthusiastic about doing this, and you get good videos. And um, for TikTok, we don't have that because we are no TikTok users. By but I always have this in mind because I think it's. Um, it's a channel for younger students who, who use it regularly. Um, but um, no, we don't use it yet, but uh, it's possible that this is coming in the near future, or not in the near future, but in the future. 
I think I think that's right. I think it's um, if if you kind of if you have to almost force people to do something like this, it doesn't work. You can tell there has to be that enthusiasm because it, the enthusiasm comes across. And it's largely our customer services, so our, our front of house, our desk staff, who who do a lot of the social media. Um, so it's you know it's not necessarily the liaison team who do the teaching. Um, it's it is our customer services staff who are happy to um, just get a bit more involved in something a little different. So we're quite lucky, I think. Anything that involves the seagulls at Liverpool always goes down very well. We have lots of seagulls around the library. <laughs> I, I, I've just put in the, the chat um, the link to, to, to the Black Country Museum, um, which is the kind of the, the museum that I suppose took off most in terms of its engagement with TikTok. And I mean, it, for, a, for a small regional museum in, 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 in the English Midlands to, um, to have a piece of social media content that gets nearly 30 million views, is just you know it shows that it shows the the power of these of, of these things and i think you know maybe uh, i'm, I'm going to be provocative here maybe we should be saying asking the question why on earth are we not on TikTok? um rather rather than you know maybe maybe we should be, be. so yeah I, I i'd encourage people to check that out because it's really it's really lovely content as well it's just it's just it's just the volunteers um in the museum just talking about what they do so it is that that human connection that's why it's been so successful i think 